So we are live, Naomi. I think we are live. So um, welcome you. Should, am I? Am uh, who, who's going to be? The, we don't really have leaders and followers in our in our little world. I mean, this is an anarchic community here, so um, we did not ordain any higher power with with I those mean, sorts of privileges. Should I introduce you and you introduce me? Sure, sounds wonderful. Well, I'm here with the wonderful Jeffrey T Tucker, who needs absolutely no introduction because um, he is incredible. You guys, I'm sure you've all read his later piece, latest piece uh, about the Ross Ulbricht sentencing, which is why we're here tonight to talk about that. So, Jeffrey, your words are just beautiful, and they really sum up the um, humongous issue that we're facing right now, which is mm. the people against the government. That's essentially what this is. Um, mm. I will let you go ahead and. And introduce me. Yeah, if you no, I just want to note the fact that you 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 chose to go first, even though we didn't really have a democratic election. <laughs> spontaneous <laughs> order. That's okay, okay. <laughs> spontaneous leadership, right? <laughs> so I'm here with a with a with a beautiful and and um, impossibly charming Naomi Brockwell, who's at the Motion Moving Picture Institute, and um, yourself, a, a a wonderful personality and intellectual force, and I I think. That you've had a very special interest in the in the Ross Ulbricht case, didn't you? Actually, were you involved in the trial at any level? Remember, did you attend? Uh... Yeah, so I was I was at the sentencing the other day, and it was uh, it was unbelievably traumatic uh, for everyone there. And, and I know that everyone has really felt the pain of this whole issue because we're just seeing the defence be handicapped it's ev at every stage of this trial. And then the sentencing really brought home to me the humongous problem that we're facing right now. Um, it, uh, being there in, in, in the courtroom when the sentence was pronounced, uh, it was just, it was unbelievable. Um, the, so the courtroom was packed and then they had two overflow rooms as well, two separate rooms that were filled with people. Uh, I was in one of the overflow rooms for the first part and uh, through the whole thing, like everything the judge was saying, there were just audible gasps through the whole way through. And then for the actual sentencing, I was in the courtroom. Um, and I, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll get into all of what happened at the sentencing in a second, but I just wanted to say my heart goes out for the entire Ulbricht family. This was a horrendous miscarriage of justice that we all witnessed on Friday. So. I, I, I had some, you know, I, it's, been, it's been a tough several days for all of us, I think, uh, at, at many levels in many, many ways. Um, I think you you experienced the trauma as about as closely as it, anybody could. I obviously wasn't there, but it's it's kept me up at night. Um, yeah. Uh, I can't seem to find the the right words. I found myself um, only able to take the news in little small doses. I I didn't read Ross's letter to the judge until today, actually, because I I, I just. Sometimes I avoid things I don't want to look at, yeah. and that's sort of how I felt about about that. Um, and I found it to be a beautifully touching and, and inspiring, beautiful, extraordinary. Yeah. So let's let's um, start with um, with the judge's impression of that letter, where she basically called it um, a, a a horrible display of arrogance. Um, the I I have so many things that I want to say about this judge. Um, it, it, uh, like my goodness, she it, Ross is standing there in front of her, begging for his life, and uh, in tears, absolutely distraught because he knows what's ahead of him. And um, I, I have never witnessed anything as vicious as what I saw in the judge in the judge in addressing Ross, really? um, talking about this letter that that he wrote, um, how arrogant he is, how he clearly holds himself above the law, um, how he clearly has no regard for other people, how he's this callous, malicious person. Um, there were all these ad hominem attacks. What was worse than the ad hominem attacks, though, was a judge using uncharged crimes when determining what sort of a sentence to give someone. And that's really what it comes down to, the fact that Russ has never been indicted for any murder charge. And you cannot use information that was not brought to trial that clearly they did not have enough evidence to bring to trial because the two leading investigators in this whole case were incredibly corrupt um, and so that no evidence probably exists for this um, and the fact that she used that in describing his in, in creating his the sentence I just I, it was beyond me I mean 
it, it started off, the, the, I, I feel like the, the murmurs in the crowd really started when she started reading through some of the things that, that, that he did, right? Um, it, it started when he start, they, she started talking about how many drugs passed through Silk Road and then when she said that he was, <laughs> was being directly linked to all of these. She was counting it as if he had directly sold all of these drugs. Um, do you think she understood that that wasn't oh, true? I mean, uh, I, I mean, I think you know what I think she understood exactly what she was doing, and I think that there were some really underhanded things going on with this. And the reason I say that is because at every stage of the trial, the defense were handicapped. You know, the fact that that a week before trial, the defense had thousands and thousands and thousands of, of extra pages popped on their desk that the, the prosecution was going to take to court. They had like such limited time to go through it all. Um, the fact that they tried to bring in expert witnesses uh, to actually describe the technology and, and why multiple moderators uh, could have had access at any time to, to all of these things um, and how you couldn't actually link a single person to, to any of these things. I mean, they, they denied their uh, request for for any of these moderate uh, any of these expert witnesses um, I mean the, the judge oh my goodness so it, she talked at length saying like oh and I, I it just drives me insane to think about it. she's uh, this is a horrible person she's talking about how a um, uh, hundred people gave letters uh, you know testimonials about Ross's character Right, and how moving it was, and how heavy the burden was on her, and how she never wants to have to judge another person, and she's really getting into this emotive thing about um, her trials and tribulations of having to judge someone. And then after maybe like you know 15 minutes of going on at length of this and saying, "Oh, Ross, you know, you clearly don't fit the description of a criminal mastermind. You know, it's it's really com complicated, and you're a very complicated person. And I've had to weigh this against this, and I read this report and this report, and she's citing all of these reports." that are about how uh, incarceration um, rates are through the roof, about how the war on drugs is failing, uh, about how um, uh, recidivism, is that how you pronounce it, rates um, are, are just huge with, with this in, sort of incarceration, how it actually creates criminality, how, like all of these awful things to do with the justice system. She was saying, oh, and I read this, and I read this. And then after she was done, you know, <laughs> giving this lovely little disclaimer and preface, she went into the most cold-hearted attack on his character and everything about him and just saying, like, you know, you are dangerous to the community. Um, talking about all of these accounts about how he's a callous murderer. He, she, she proceeded to bring in two family members of victims that have died of, of drug-related deaths. Now, let's look a little bit about that. So, first of all, I mean, no autopsies were done on these on these people. So, the cause of death isn't actually known, but that's just a technicality. Um, uh, the defense brought up the, up the point of saying, listen, you, you can't blame Ross for doing something that is... This is, in, this is in, the, in the closing statements? This is I mean, in not, the closing this, statements. This, this, this is before thing? the sentence was, was released. So, it was I, I so inappropriate. It was so yeah. inappropriate. Two family members of, of people who died from drug-related um, uh, like overdoses or, or whatnot uh, were brought in. And you know what? It was heart-wrenching. Um, and so inappropriate to bring them in. Well, I don't. Is that normally done at a? No, sentence? I mean, I don't. I don't even know. Like but it was disgusting, of the trial. Right? Because my heart goes out for those families. Right. Um, and it, clearly, they're going through these awful things. But you know what? The the family members then proceeded to talk about Ross and say what a sociopath he was, and what a you know hardened criminal he was, and what a what a disgusting person he was, and how he deserves in their mind the the um, worst punishment possible. And that is so inappropriate. I'm sorry, but but inviting two people, I mean, that is exactly why our um, our court system has evolved so that the, the victim doesn't uh, doesn't decide on this on the sentence or on the punishment of, of the criminal, right? Because all this emotion gets involved. And so, what does the the prosecution do? Bring in these two victims to you know pull on everyone's emotions and try to see like seem like this entire farce was justified. Um, and it, it was it was 
awful to hear them talk about Ross that way. Uh, like, I mean, they don't know anything about him. They don't even know if he was, you know, connected to in, in any way to um to Silk Road. I mean, he they talk about him like he was he was a, a murderer. They mention that many many times, um, and that just drives me insane. That everyone is spreading these absolutely malicious rumors about things that that Ross has never been charged with. I mean, these this is clearly. Um, you know, slandering Ross's name all over the media in order to uh, create some sort of persona around him, darken his image. Yeah, yeah it's been very frustrating for me the last several days because, of course, you know, now, now that this is in the news, you know, everybody with a Facebook profile feels uh, in, entitled to, you know, have a judgment about it. Yeah. And, um, and many of us have spent probably far too much time trying to correct. Yeah. Uh, the problems I, are very frustrating because, you know, these sort of armchair adjudicators mm -hmm. you know, sitting around with their Facebook accounts, you know, saying, oh, well, you know, the non-aggression principle, you know, mm -hmm. clearly stood in violation of it and so on. I mean, it's it's really, it's really revolting. Yeah. I mean, I came out of that trial and I, um, as I said, I, I don't even know how, how Lynn, um, it felt coming out of there, or how how the rest of his family felt coming out of there. But I felt physically ill. I felt like there is no longer anywhere to turn. Right? When you have such a, a blatant miscarriage of justice, and you have a judge citing things that a person has never been charged with, and so far above the law, and not letting the defense, you know, come in to counter any of these claims, the the fact that the defense wasn't even allowed to explore the legitimacy of the digital evidence, every piece of evidence in this trial was digital. Every piece of evidence. Now, I'm sorry, but it, the precedent that that sets uh, now that, that is that digital evidence is admissible in court. And what is wrong with that is that it is so easily corruptible. Now, they took Ross's laptop. They, it was completely unencrypted. They had complete access to everything on there. And the defense were not even allowed to investigate whether or not the logs in which, you know, these murder for hire uh, suggestions were, were, were created or placed there or tampered with or any of that. There, there's absolutely no way to verify this. Now, if the if the courts were actually interested in having a fair trial, rather than just saying, "Listen, we found someone. Let's do whatever it takes to convict him. Let's not let you know the defense weasel its way out." Like, if they were actually interested in learning through a trial whether he was guilty or innocent, he should have let them explore all options to make sure that the two incredibly corrupt police officers that were leading the investigation did not plant evidence. I mean, they stole hundreds of millions of dollars from Silk Road. Um, they've already been charged with that. That is the whole reason why these murder for charge, um, murder for hire charges can't go to court because it's. I mean. They, it's just so embroiled in, in, in corruption at this stage, and yet the judge found it appropriate to bring up those things he has never been charged with in the sentencing. To well, let, let's just back up, uh, back up one quick oh. second, because I'm not sure that, that people entirely understand this, but, but uh, essentially what you're saying is that, uh, that the government did not want the murder for hire charges to be part of the trial. Yeah. Because... Um, uh, because the the people who made the claims, or at least were at some level embroiled in, in, uh, in, in, in the, in the, in the chat logs, right, were themselves found guilty of, of, of they were like sting operators, you know, who who then stole money, right? Yeah. Well, there's so much corruption involved with the the officers, um, and I mean, what's what's more is even if you read the logs, um. It, it, it's such a setup. It's such an unbelievable setup. Um, and who knows how much of the logs were tampered with? Who knows if the logs were real? I mean, it's uh, there's so much up in the air. And honestly, I think we'd all feel better if that was actually allowed to be explored by the defense. Well, I think that um, was that was just it. I mean, it was the defense that wanted the charges uh, made so that they could be subject to the normal exactly, rules of exactly. discovery. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, it's just uh, it, it's it's absolutely insane how this whole thing has been. But what, what, tell, tell me, what, do you know if the murder for hire thing was was part of the closing statements of the prosecution? It was all part of the the closing statements, and what's worse is that it was part of the entire speech that the judge gave. I, I mean, she she spent like an hour talking about how he is a danger to society and clearly saw himself as above the law and is callous and is killing people. And I just, I mean, I 
I couldn't handle that. You know, it, it's just it, it's so disgusting. <laughs> well, you know, I I, um, I mean, everybody, you know, we all know the court system is corrupt and it's a terrible bureaucracy and awful. But you know, I think most of us believe that at some level, um, this is just an not an utterly lawless system in the sense that you know you can't just do whatever whatever you want. Um, uh, so how do you suppose that this 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 comes about? I mean, I guess I'm 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 just wondering like like how did it happen that you can have a judge uh, cite all these things that he wasn't wasn't uh, convicted of? Or right. Well, I mean, uh, so I think that there are a few things at work here. And if anyone hasn't seen the latest film by Alex Winter, Deep Web, uh, you should see it. It's it's a really okay, good. Okay, so film. I've not seen that. Is it, is that on at the theater near near you? Uh, it was on at the Brooklyn uh, Film Festival, so I saw it on the weekend. But it was also available for uh, light, for stream. So um, it's probably available somewhere. Um, okay. uh, I think that I mean he he brought up a good point in 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 that it's like I mean Nixon said that the we failed on in the war of drugs <laughs> like, I, this has been failing for forty years right it's it's not working and you wonder why it's being perpetuated and why the government is holding up examples of why you know drugs are bad and we need to cut them down and he looks at all of the special interest groups that are entrenched this isn't just about the government agencies that have been set up and will be completely disenfranchised uh, if the war on drugs stops this is also about you know drug testing companies Companies who have access to um, people who are, are in prison, you know, who are coerced to take part in certain tests. Like there, there are a lot of special interest groups writing on this, and I'm not sure we will see the end of the war on drugs. You've also got the, the yeah. problem of the, the the drug lords. I always thought that that in many ways, you know, the most the biggest danger the so-called faced was was not from governments but from um, drug lords. Right, right. Well, I mean, I um, it's just. There's so much more I want to talk about with, with in regards to what happened at the sentencing. Like she pull, pulled the privilege card. Like she, I. Yeah, talking about told, about his privileges and his but, educational yeah, privileges. She, she like basically told him to check his privilege. She said how um, I mean they were talking about Dr. X. Now for those of you who don't know, um, on the Silk Road payroll was a um, a doctor who actually advised people. Um, in in regard to drugs and, and safety and everything, so different thing, different parts of logs were were read uh, at the hearing. For example, at the, at the sentencing, for example, someone asked, you know, oh, I want to take ecstasy for the first time. I'm type two diabetes. Is this going to affect my blood glucose level? I mean, this is the type of stuff that you want to hear from a professional, but you can't ask your doctor why because it's illegal, right? Um, so they go to these people on online, and um, and he was basically told, well, no, it's not going to affect your glucose levels, but you will be become forgetful probably, so set your alarm so you remember to take insulin shots. And that sort of stuff, I mean, the judge reacted to that and told Ross how irresponsible he was for allowing someone to come on and do that and encourage the use of drugs. And I think what the ju judge, like, fails to see is that a person has the capacity for individual choice. And if they're choosing to take ecstasy, uh, they're going to do it regardless. So let's try and ensure that they do it in the most safe way possible. Now this point also came up when one of the fathers of the victims came up. And this was the, uh, the victim was a heroin addict. You know, he'd, he'd done heroin before, uh, he got back into it. So this was something he was uh, uh, well acquainted with. And our father t said, listen, our, our son had a problem, but he couldn't talk to anyone for help. Let's look at why he couldn't talk to anyone for help. Because heroin is illegal and he's a criminal for using heroin. Now this is what we are doing. We are stopping people from having the ability to actually ask for help, to, to reach out and find out about safety or to, to ask for support in this sort of thing. And this is a disgusting system that we're perpetuating here. Um, I mean, the, the fact that the, the, the judge basically said, to Ross that you know you're you're coming from such a privileged position you pretend that you're helping people ha by having someone like like Dr X on the site um, but honestly like so much of these drugs are being sold wholesale um, and it's really naive of you to think otherwise so these drugs are going to the street corner and uh, and being sold to to poor black kids and you're sitting there in your privileged position thinking that you're doing some good where you know people are out there dying and I was just like oh my god I mean there's so many facts actually incorrect 
things about that. Um, if you look at the logs, actually, it was one of the DHS uh, agents who um, who really pushed the the the, um, the sale of drugs to, to larger amounts as well. But I mean, on on top of that, telling Ross to check his privilege when. She is sitting there on her throne, passing judgment on this man that's going to destroy his life forever, talking about how awful it is to have a son ripped away from someone, you know, um, because of drugs, and here she is ripping someone else's son away from them. I mean, I, the whole thing was just, it is just awful. She herself is, she's about 50, I saw she was 51 years old. Uh, she seemed to have been appointed by Obama. Um, yeah, it was like Chuck Schumer or, or someone. Yeah, she um, she seemed to have been a, something like a commercial litigator who uh, <laughs> defended a large corporate interests in, in, in their int intellectual property claims. At least that's what her uh, Wikipedia page says. Yeah. So, um, you know, this this is you know uh, talk about privilege, right? I mean, yeah, yeah this is um, whereas whereas Ross never. You know, yeah, yeah. They talk about Ross like he's some sort of millionaire. Um, that he's had this privilege his whole life, not actually looking at his background. That he was an entrepreneur who went out there and tried to make the streets a safer place. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what does it say on his LinkedIn profile? I, I quoted it on my Facebook. It's just such a brilliant quote where he basically said he wants to use economic forces uh, for good to decrease the amount of violence in the world. Yeah. To decrease sure. the like. Well, I, I mean, I mean I, Naomi, I. I know this. I corresponded with him before the Silk Road was founded. I mean, I know this about him. Yeah. Um, oh, it's um, and you corresponded with him. This is an idealist, and he just wanted to bring peace to the world, you know, and that's that's that was the whole thing. Yeah, you corresponded with him uh, the other day as well on the phone, correct? Well, I spoke to him, but yeah. Um, but I, that was the first contact I'd had from him since before the Silk Road was founded, where I, I just had an exchange of emails with him. You know. Yeah. Yeah, no, the... Um, he's a, he's, a, he's a, a libertarian idealist. Yeah, no, he's, it's amazing. Um, it's amazing all the things that, that were written. And the judge came out and, and said to him, listen, I've read everything that the defense uh, has provided, and it just shows me how misguided all of you are. What you have said is just wrong. It is incorrect. Um, you know, the, the war on drugs is working. She kept saying, like, all these blatantly false things. Um, and and, and she, she was saying, like, this ideology that you and your friends, you, your flag-waving friends, uh, uh, cite, it's dangerous. You are, you know, um, you're dangerous to society. You need to be locked up. I mean, look at this. Like, she gave Ross the absolute maximum uh, ranking for uh, criminal threat to society, the absolute maximum you could possibly get. He also, she also gave him the absolute minimum uh, ranking in terms of criminal history, past criminal history. I mean, this is someone who's never committed a crime before, never come in contact with the law, being like they're saying like he's the absolute threat to society. And the defense put forward a motion to say, listen, um, he is such a non-violent person. Everything about him is non-aggression. Um, can he be uh, downgraded to a, a medium security prison? And she denied the request. And when she said that, I just, I mean, I think there were a lot of people crying with that because we know what that means. I mean, maximum security prison is so dangerous and Ross is not a dangerous person. And this is just, I mean, this is going to be torture for the rest of his life. Like he's, I mean, I, I don't even want to say it, but like I, the implications are, are clear on that. Like say, say like fleshing out the details of that, it just is, is awful. So, so, I mean, I, how can I ask this? Um, do you think this is just the malice of one person at work, or do you think that she... Well, I mean, uh, from what I've heard um, about the, uh, the ongoing trial, everything the events came up against, it just seems like it was a tag team the entire way. Uh, it seems like this was a showcase. I mean, honestly, like let's call this what it was, like a Soviet show trial. And I know that they are very vicious words, but that is what this entire experience has been, right? Um, and it, it feels like 
everything the defense tried to do to actually give Ross a fair trial, to give him him a say, you know, to stand up for himself. They, they were just handicapped at every turn. Um, and the, the judge just helped them all along the way. You know, prosecution is objecting every two seconds and the judge is just letting this go on. And um, everything, you know, every motion that the defense brings up, she denies. Every motion that the prosecution brings up, she accepts. Like, this isn't coincidence here. You know, it's not just like <laughs> the prosecution was right all the time. Like, there was such an incredible bias going on here. There is no way that this was just um, like a, a malicious judge. I, I feel like this is this is a show trial. They they needed the government needed this to be a warning to other people. Right? To a warning against against what? Oh God, against people standing up to government. Really? I mean, this is a person who. I mean, that she she called him the biggest threat to society because he said that government was his enemy. You know. Um, he said that he wants peace. He said that the drug war I I isn't working. Um, and she basically said that he is, is so dangerous to society because of these views that he holds, because he holds himself above the law. No, maybe he just wants to challenge really shitty laws. Is that not what the people have the right to do? Do we not have well, to Well, every, every entrepreneur, every, 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 every entrepreneur does exactly this. Yeah. I mean, the UPS challenged the post office, you know. Yeah. Um, no, Apple's I... challenging the, phone, the old phone companies and, um, yeah. you know, every disrupt. I mean, we live in times where everybody's praising the glories of disruptive, yeah. um, you know, innovation and, and non-compliance with the vast regulatory machine. So for her to act as, you know, it's very strange too. I mean, this, this attitude that, well, Ross, you, you live on the internet, which you think, you know, it somehow exempts you from democratic mandate. You know, we all live on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is the nature of our life. Mm -hmm. For to somehow single out this guy as if he was some sort of outline, you know, rebel, as versus really emblematic of an entire generation of people yeah. who are, are trying to escape the con confines of the overly regulated physical world. I mean, uh, Ross, I mean, everybody is Ross at this point in history, you know? Yeah. I mean, this is, it sets such scary precedents as well, doesn't it? Um, first of all, the fact that digital um, evidence is now being just taken <laughs> as it is and, and um, people don't seem to think that we actually need to investigate to see the, find out the legitimacy, the authenticity of this evidence. Um, second of all, I mean, the, the whole warrant issue, this is why we fought <laughs> the, the uh, revolution, right? You know, um, uh, Britain was all about just going into people's private spaces and America said, no, let's actually have specific warrants. Um, and then suddenly 90% of our lives lives on the internet and the government says, oh, this is a free-for-all. As soon as you put it on the net, that means we can go into ed every, not even the net. As soon as you, this goes in digital form, we have the right to go through everything of your, every part of your life that's been digitized. That is every part of our life these days that I mean it, it is just insane that they now the precedent has been set up that they're allowed to do that they don't need a specific warrant I mean they would need a specific warrant to, to go into someone's one's house right I mean what about the files online I, it's just it just blows my mind and I mean the, the the judge also I mean she had she had two different qualms right she first of all said, listen, you, were, you had this ideological fight. You were fighting against what you thought was a bad law. First of all, you know, don't hold yourself above the law. The laws are there for a reason. Uh, you make society a dangerous place. But then she said, but the fight you're fighting against, you're just wrong. And she said that to him, like, you are wrong. And she cited all the reasons why, you know, Ross's ideology is wrong. And she made this an ideological battle. You know, she, she brought ideology into this. The defence were not allowed to bring up Russ's ideology at any That's point right. in the trial. Um, and she brought it up. She brought it up and the, she cherry-picked part of it and she basically said, um, you know, the, 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 you say that government is your enemy. You're clearly trying to bring down society. You, you, you are the enemy. You are dangerous. You need to be locked up forever. Now, that's amazing to think that it was, it was actually a political trial. And I think that's basically what you're saying, um, which, is, which, is why, which, which is why I think this this whole trial and incident and situation should be of concern to anybody who loves human liberty 
and aspires more for the world than for it to be run, you know, by by gigantic authoritarian states, you know, until the end of time. Yeah. And 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 libertarians who think that that the Ross Ulbrich uh, trial is is of no relevance to them are are completely wrong. Uh, this is. Yeah, I've I've developed a sense over the last three days. I'm going to have a hard time expressing it. That the significance of this, of this trial and the sentencing, is is probably more substantial than I think anybody has yet realized. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, you know, it representing a kind of a full scale frontal attack by the regime, you know, against those who would aspire. Yeah, the world to be a better place, essentially. Yeah. I um, um, you know, there's also a, a funny thing like like the fallout from this is um, interesting because we normally think of you know harsh sentences being designed to sort of deter others, you know, which is yeah. which is a slightly wicked way to think of sentencing. I mean, that that shouldn't actually be the idea. I mean, it's, ideally, sentencing would, would somehow reflect you know the demands for justice, not some some instrumental design to desire to deter others but there's another factor here too that if if the drug warriors and the fbi and the and the uh, you know the the whole as uh, you know architecture of oppression you know were to seek to recruit others into their ranks in a similar way to the these rogue agents you know that were working for the FBI. Now they have a case. You know they can go up to you know, practically anybody and say, "Look, we know, we know for a fact you've done some wrong things, yeah. and observe what happened to Russell Bricht. So you work with us, yeah, or you will meet a similar fate. Yeah. So it creates a, a a very dangerous situation for you know probably millions." Of, of people. Um, no, it's terrifying. Uh, yeah. It's absolutely terrifying. Like I walked out of that trial, like just one, what do we do next? You know, what, what do we do now? Uh, clearly the individual no longer has the right to a fair trial. There was no fair trial given to Ross. Um, and uh, that is with a huge amount of support behind him. And they were just flat out denied. And it is terrifying to think what the government is capable of, how invasive they are in our private lives, um, and what's what's going to happen next. You know, it's it's terrifying. Who who attended um, the the sentencing hearing? Why were there so many people? Was it was it all media or just people who are interested in human rights and? I think that there are a lot of people who uh, felt very strongly about this case. This was very important to a lot of people. It's important to people, anyone who believes in, in individual rights. It's important to believe, uh, to anyone who believes that um, the incarceration rate in this country is disgusting and that the war on drugs isn't working and we need to do something to change it. And it's important for anyone who's interested in the digital sphere, right, because this case just sets ridiculous precedents. Um, I also feel that, I mean, so many people were hanging on every word of this trial. Um, Sarah Jong had a, a, did an amazing job covering it as well, talking about what happened each day and as where was, as, where was this I, I i'm not sure i saw these reports where were they i mean she she rep she wrote them in in forbes um okay. basically okay. outlining what what happened each day at the trial and i think okay. people were really looking at these reports and um and seeing what a miscarriage of justice it was all along the way now the defense couldn't really talk about the miscarriage of justice um until the sentencing was carried out because you know up until then there was still a glimmer of hope that perhaps they could could get through to the judge this um, was a problem for the defense right because they, 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 they tried their best to play nice yeah uh, as much as possible in hopes of some leniency for ross Basically, I mean, the, the defense's plan was to, uh, through a line of questioning with certain uh, witnesses, to bring out the storyline that, that outlined that there was so much, you know, corruption associated with this, that uh, you can't trust the authenticity of digital evidence. I mean, if, if this trial was actually to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that uh, Russ Ulbricht was, was guilty, there was, I mean, there was so much doubt. This was not proven beyond a reasonable doubt. This 
case was riddled with doubt. And you know what? All of that doubt was washed away with this implication of murder for hire that was never actually charged, just and to, alluded to. Um, do you think that aff that affected the, the, the jury? Because it, it comes oh, out in the... I yeah. mean, I, I've been tweeting about this all weekend. I, um, it's like when someone is so powerless, what do you do? Well, I, you go straight to the communications website. You just try to, to uh, network with people to try and see what sort of support network is out there. So I've just been like tweeting and trying to wrap my head around this. And I was getting these idiots just reply to me saying, like, Ross Ulbricht does no hero. He, you know, killed six people. And it's like, I, I, I don't even know what to say to that. There's only so many times I can tell someone to actually do some research before they start accusing people of things, right? We're innocent until proven guilty. Has Ross actually been charged with any of these crimes? No. We've got to wonder why. Well, there wasn't the even any crime. I yeah. mean, that's, that's, there was never any any uh, any bodies. There was yeah. No at all. I mean, I, I'm, I'll bring up a very controversial analogy, and people may hate me for this, um, but honestly, this is this is an analogy that makes sense to me. Um, Let's say that may, let, 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 let's say that they were uh, Ross did try to get 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 people killed. Um, let's actually look at the context around that, right? Now I'm not saying he did. I don't believe he did. I believe that the evidence was incredibly corrupt and that we can't trust any of it. But if he did, I would not blame him because this is this would be like someone blackmailing Schindler and saying, hey, give us your list. Give us the list of all of these Jewish people that these families are hiding. This is, this is like um, the family next door going to, to their next door neighbor and saying, hey, I know you're hiding a huge family of Jews and uh, we're going to tell the authorities and they're gonna come and they're gonna kill every single Jew uh, in here. What would you do? I mean, would you err on the side of right or wrong? Because it is wrong, it is wrong to, uh, take an action that you know is going to get a huge amount of people killed and for the next door neighbor to come along and say listen <laughs> I, I know you're hiding jews and i'm going to tell the authorities and i'm going to get all of you killed yeah I, i'd probably take out a hit on them too you know and this is for the internet to hear that 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 is how i feel about this because i do not believe in blackmail i do not believe in blackmailing where people's lives are in danger and that is exactly what we're dealing with we are dealing with thousands of lives, lives that, that matter, you know? Um, and, and the fact that incarceration is just so incredibly damaging to society as a whole, you know, in particular to poorer communities, it is just entrenching this cycle of poverty. It's disgusting. Like if, if these, these uh, hits actually happened, you know, I'm not sure that I would be entirely against them. That being said, I don't believe that they did. And the reason I believe that is because it was never brought to trial because the prosecution knew that they did not have the evidence to substantiate it. So what did they do? They felt good enough to take all of that, that um, information to the media but did not feel that it was strong enough to take to court. Now, what yeah. does that tell you? That says that they were just planning on slandering his name and it's, it's, it's disgusting. And honestly, the media shouldn't buy into that. The media should be reporting what Ross actually was charged with, not having these headlines that say, Ross Ulbricht hired all these people to get murdered. I, I mean, no, Like, let's presume that he is innocent and let's actually see what, what the prosecution brought to trial. Can, can I ask you, I mean, we, we all are, I mean, one of the things that's been just so devastating about this whole thing for all of us is that all along we all, you know, held out some hope and then suddenly, you know, there was, there was no, uh, no hope at all, right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, what, what are the chances that, um, what are the what are the what are the chances that that you know the the, the appeal of this or is that just is that just absurd? Well, what, say that again. What are the chances of an appeal? So they are taking it to appeal. They're they're appealing this. Um, I I hope that it's successful. Uh, honestly, I I think that there was such a blatant miscarriage of justice that it needs to be successful in appeal. Um, if you look at yeah, of course, but I mean what. It seems like, you know, if you're right that this was not just the sort of the malice of of one judge, you know, that there seems to be a sort of a, uh, you know, a system-wide, you know, sort of... But attempt. are all people in the system on the same side? 
you know, I, I'm sure that there are people out there who very much disagree with the with the war on drugs, and there are. Um, the defence actually cited some of these people and said it is not consistent that everyone believes that this is a good thing. People have actively spoken out about this. Judges have spoken out about this. Now, it is was it just luck that the Ross Ulbricht trial uh, got allocated a judge who is so outspoken against, I mean, in favour of the war on drugs? I mean, it, it seems like it was planned that well, way, right? Well, let me ask, uh, how much do you know about, <clears throat> I'm sorry to sort of uh, see, pr keep pressing on this, but I mean, what, what are the actual chances that an, uh, an appeal could, could uh, you know, has any hope of success at all? Do you have any read of that? I, I don't know. I, I, maybe I'm a hopeless optimist, but I <laughs> honestly believe that, um, at, at the very least, this would lessen uh, Ross's charge. And I believe that because what he was charged with, the kingpin charge on top of like the internet espionage charge, I mean, no one would ever associate the running of Silk Road with any sort of espionage charge. It's just, that's just so completely disparate. Um, the fact that they were all lumped together and, and charged against him is actually insane. The kingpin charge being charged with running like an ongoing uh, criminal enterprise is actually insane. You know, he hosted a, a, a website. Like, I mean, it's just, all of this is blown so far out of proportion. If you look at rapists, they get eight years, right? Eight, eight years. Um, so we need to actually look at, uh, at other drug related crimes and what they're charged with compared to what R Ross got, which was, you know, two life sentences plus 35 years plus, I mean, plus $185 million or, so, or what, however much it was. It, I mean, it, it's actually insane. So I honestly think that they're going to look at this uh, sentencing and say, yeah, this is entirely out of line. Who, who, is, who, is, who is, when you say they, who is they? Well, I hope whoever they appeal to. I mean, that's, that's all we can do at this point. I'm not going to discourage anyone for believing in the hope of the trial because I know that the, the Albury family desperately need people's help uh, to actually finance this. So, again, like if anyone wants to go to uh, freeross.org and donate money to the appeal, I, I this is the way to take a stand. This is like the last bastion mm -hmm. of hope here. I believe that it's going to be be fruitful in some respect. Um, but the only way it is is if, if they can actually pay to make it go forward so you know, I, it's it's fascinating to me because there, i mean we've all written about these issues um you know for some of us for a very long time you know and about the corruption of the of the state and and the system and the wrongness of the of the laws and just how everything sort of stacked up against the common person and so on but but there's something something that happens to you. and you read about it in history i mean you you read about socrates you read about the you know the burning of, of witches and and the the uh, the killing of escaped slaves and and so on. You know, um, and you know we read about Martin Luther King standing up standing up against yeah. um, uh, illegitimate laws and and how you know, he was spied upon and ultimately murdered and so on. But but there's, it's just very interesting to me, at least for me personally, to see the effects that it had on me to to uh, see this whole thing unfold in our own time. I mean, more than any sort of individual miscarriage of justice that I can ever remember. Yeah, you know, this no, one seems to have have personalized and brought and brought home, you know, the reality yeah. of of just how to you know the this the the personal and moral consequences of sort of a, a this despotism. Yeah. Like like few things else I I can ever remember. At least for me personally, it's it's had that effect, you know? Yeah, I feel like, um, I mean, a lot of people have been arguing with me the past few days saying, well, you know, he seems like an okay guy, but he did break the law. And so he needs to be punished. Yeah, I've heard and, that too. Oh, God, and it drives me insane. So, And they say, well, he should appeal as part of the system. That's what the system's there well, for. Well, it's very like, interesting. What if, like yeah, what if the system is incredibly corrupt? What if there is no recourse for you? What if the system itself is against you, right? right. What about that and, slave owner? And the that law is, is, is yeah. egregiously wrong. You know, yeah. if, you're, if you're a hotel owner in 1950, to in, in um, Knoxville, Tennessee, and you yeah. allow you know a black family to stay there, and you get prosecuted by the local government for being in violation of the segregation codes. Exactly. You know, I mean, are you going to be tweeting out, "Wow"? Well, yeah. So let's actually look at someone who walked worked within the system. What was his name? Um, you know, the the case where that slave uh, fled. He finally escaped. He got to the north and was like, "Woo, I'm free!" and started a family. And then um, the owners came back to reclaim him, and they took it to the the high court. Right? They took it to them, and the court said, "Oh, sorry." 
um, uh, we don't recognize your claim uh, to announce yourself free because you are property and you are private property and you are this person's private property and sent him back. He escaped and they sent him back. The court sent him back. The government sent him back. That is what happens when you work within the system. Sometimes the system isn't good enough to handle these things. Sometimes you need people to go outside the system well, to actually this, create a system that enables freedom, like Ross this did. Is, this is the whole history of progress, Naomi. I mean, yeah. from the ancient world to the to the present. It's been a matter of get, going outside of, of uh, deeply corrupt laws. You yeah. Know? Law, laws against 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 heresy against uh, freeing slaves. I mean, that is why I'm so excited about technologies like the blockchain, like Bitcoin. Uh, that's why I love peer to peer technologies. That's why Silk Road was amazing. But you know what? Silk Road had a big flaw. It was centralized. Uh, look at at um, uh, Open Bazaar. I mean, that's that's exciting. If if they can make it work, a decentralized black market. Let's enable people to actually be free and outside of this horrendous war on drugs. Uh, in a way yeah, that can't be shut down by government. What's also striking about this, and, and I'm sure the judge knows this, I mean, the shutdown of Silk Road, of course, from the from the drug warrior point of view, you know, accomplished absolutely oh. nothing. You know, The Economist uh, magazine ran an, an, an article where they did their best estimate yeah. of, yeah. of dark, war, dark web uh, uh, peer to peer drug exchanges, and, and they're running, you know, four and five, five times. But they were in Silk Road one. Not to mention the fact, you know, and I, I, I visited the Silk Road. I think I'm mean, thinking back about it. I think it was Silk Road one I visited, and the thing that struck me, uh, and this would have been a few years ago, right? Um, that it was it was pretty clear that the main product people were buying was was marijuana. Yeah. And in the intervening years, uh, between when I first. Um, visited the site and today um, marijuana is legal in in many many parts of the country and is increasingly um where it's not legal just completely overlooked as being you know um a, a, you know just just a minor a minor thing um and so the law has already changed. Uh, like the, as far as I can tell, you know that was the main product sold on the Silk Road. Well, I mean, but already since that time, the laws have been liberalized. Yeah, I, I would even be careful with that. Like, I think that certain states are getting smart, but uh, the federal government of America is dangerous. It is dangerous. The states, there are some great states in America. The federal government is dangerous, and it doesn't matter whether or not a state has legalized marijuana, it is still illegal in the United States. The federal government has effectively said, oh, we're gonna choose not to prosecute, you know, do your thing, but next next government we might, or soon we might change our mind. The threat is always there. And what makes it worse is that marijuana is listed as a schedule one drug. You know, cocaine isn't even listed as a schedule one drug. And yet you know, marijuana is so inherently evil that it, it has been listed as the schedule one drug that is so too dangerous to be able to enable any sort of medical testing with that is so dangerous that if someone gets caught smoking a joint, they get sent to um, sent to jail for is it like ten or twenty year mandatory minimum? It, like it's just absolutely insane. I, I, I it it's great that the states are moving in that direction, but we have a long way to go. And I think that the only way we're going to me get the message across is for people to actually start petitioning federal government and saying, you know, we won't stand for this. This is not good enough that you're choosing not to uh, prosecute marijuana. You need to actually abolish these laws. Yeah. It's just it's just not going, it's not enough that they're handing us their scraps and say, here, you know, here's some nice little little scraps for you um, just to keep you keep you wanting more. It's, it's just not good enough anymore and we need to be, be fighting this. Another product that, that became very commonly sold on, on the Silk Road were uh, prescription drugs that were <laughs> legal Yep. That are legal in in Canada, and and Mexico, but had yet to be approved uh, through the yeah. FDA. Uh, yeah. Oh. That that was uh, another thing that that people. So you know these are these are drugs that are like uh, uh, drugs for rare diseases. You know, and um, uh, you know experimental drugs that that were you know helping people's lives. Yeah. Um, that that are used commonly in Canada and Mexico, but just were otherwise not available in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, and they were available through 
I'm so proud. And so. it brings up the right to try, doesn't it? The fact that the government has made it illegal for you to try any any drugs that are, are not approved by the FDA. Now, what the mm. right to try movement um, is doing is is petitioning, like if you are have a terminal illness, if you are going to dr die anyway, then do not make it illegal for these people. Like, do not send them to jail or prosecute them for trying these drugs, which may or may not save their life. Give them right. the right to try. I, and even that is just not going far enough. We should be looking at individual responsibility. Uh, people should know that, you know, if the FDA doesn't approve something, then it's risky to take it, right? They should be able to to uh, balance that risk on their own and to judge whether or not the risk is, is worth it. If you have a terminal illness, yeah, the risk is probably worth it. Um, the, the fact that it's illegal to try these, even for those people, is just is, is absolutely insane. But let me ask you something else, uh, Naomi, about about uh, what you think the fallout of this are, is uh, ultimately. You know, the way you're sort of detailing just the, the amount of prosecutorial ab abuse and the and the bias of the court and and you, there's so many outrages along the way and and the citation of 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 uh, wrongdoings that were never actually part of the tr the trial and so on. Um, do, you th do you expect that there'll be a growing number of sort of investigative journalists and writers and others who will be interested in the case that can help uh, reveal some of this? Or do you think that the case is, is significant enough to attract, you know, some, some major journalistic interest? So I think that more needs to be done on the media front um, in favour of, of um, the case. I think that the Albrechts have been doing an incredible job and that's all they've been doing. They've been trying to combat this incredible negative media bias against Silk Road, against um, uh, drugs, all of that. Um, but they seem to be one of the very few people, uh, very few families fighting this, right? I think a lot more needs to be done to get the word out there that that this is not a war that we should be fighting and that we are destroying lives. I mean, that, that judge read out a sentence that effectively destroyed the life of an incredibly promising man who would have continued to contribute huge amounts to society. I believe he already did. I mean, Silk Road is, is phenomenal. It was proven, studies have come out that proved that it actually took violence away from the streets. Now, I'm not someone who takes drugs. I don't, I, I don't really like drugs. Um, I think other people should do whatever they want with their bodies. And I'm thankful to people like Ross for making the streets a safer place for me. You know, mm. it's just it's just common sense. Like one thing that, that also just you know, made me so in, in sense was um, the judge just cherry picked what she, what she chose to believe from, from Ross Albrecht, right? She, um, Ross gave a testimonial and said, listen, um, this is what I believe, I'm remorseful, all of, all of these things. And, um, and the judge uh, said, mm, yeah, no, I, I, don't, I don't believe you. I just don't buy it. I, I just don't know you well enough, so I'm just going to take it at face value, like the crimes in front of me. Now, what she was effectively saying was, I'm choosing to take at face value these logs that you apparently wrote and judge that as higher than what you're actually physically telling me here. These logs, which may or may not have been corrupted, with, with these logs, which should have absolutely no more value than you standing here right now, you know, talking to me. And, and instead she said, no, I'm just going to cherry pick what I believe uh, <laughs> from you. And this one I believe, this one I don't. I mean, Ross, uh, all the way through, everything that he wrote, or everything DPR wrote anyway, basically revolved around this is an e economic experiment. This is to make the world a safer place. This is to reduce violence. This is to help people so they don't get incarcerated. Um, all of these things. And the judge literally said, no, I don't believe that that was it. I believe you were motivated by greed. I believe that you were motivated by you know um, this tremendous profit. Look at the amount of money that went through Silk Road. Let's ignore the fact that it all didn't go to him, that it was a bunch of people. And she's like, oh, well, you know, you got a cut of it. You were clearly only motivated by greed. And she literally said that. Now, I'm sorry, who is she to judge out of all these things and cherry pick what she does and doesn't believe? Like, it was just so disgusting. It was awful. Are you speechless, Jeffrey? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, the, the, um, it, it's 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 a kind of situation that combines all the things I love with all the things I hate, <laughs> and uh, and smashes them all into one, you know, deeply uh, unfortunate end. And you know, I guess I'm like you, Naomi. I, you know, people call me an optimist. I never set out 
to be an optimist. I don't, mm. I, I don't, I, I don't define myself that way. I don't. I don't think. Oh, let's let's find the silver lining and everything as a, as a as a as a as a matter of principle and a, and a marketing gimmick, or whatever. That's just not who I am. I, but I, what what I actually find, is that uh, people are very disinclined to see the hopeful signs of hope and evidence of hope all around us. You know, yeah. and the more sort of despairing and dreadful the situation looks, uh, the more I think it, it falls to us to, to find, um, in a sense, mm-hmm. um, you know, possible rays of hope and, and, and things out of this. Yeah. So it's all we've got, Jeffrey. You yeah. Know? When the so, world, world looks dark, you can either say, all right, I give up now, or you can say the world looks dark. So what can we do? Yeah. Right. And I don't, I don't know. I, you know, I don't know what this hope looks like in this case. I guess is is what, but I know it's there. Yeah. Um, and I'm. Uh, this is why I keep sort of pressing around the the edges with you. Like, well, are the journalists interested in covering this in a in a in, in a detailed way? Which I, you know, I just I, I can't and and won't. I mean, I can write you know poetic tributes all day, but I'll never be able to write a definitive piece that that. Um, somehow you know shakes shakes the the legal system you know but there there are those who who can do it you know and and might yeah. um but, uh, let me cite cite one historical precedent here actually um and and then we really need i mean in fact let me just reduce this rather than just going on about this i'll just reduce it i think about the case of oscar wilde so this was a case of English, England's greatest literary mind of the 19th century, arguably, um, you know, was charged with indecency and, and convicted and jailed yeah. and then sent into exile and, and lived an impoverished life of a beggar until he was dead. It's something like the age of, I forget now, but it's very young. It's about 43 or something. Alan Turing, right? Uh, Alan Turing's another case. But, you know, the, what, what happened, actually, in the case of Oscar Wilde is that immediately after the trial, it's really true that the whole nation was saying, oh, we thought he was a wonderful playwright. It turns out he's a, a disgusting uh, oh, person, and a loathsome person and, and, and down with this guy. Um, uh, but, Naomi, within a few years, everything shifted completely to the point that just a few years later, the same people who were saying stone him, stone him, exile him, uh, good, good that England's gotten rid of this uh, loathsome person, mm-hmm. suddenly the, all of England looked inward and said, what were we thinking? This was dreadful. And it was, and 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 there was a complete repeal of um, of of the laws under which he was was prosecuted, actually, yeah. and it began this this process of liberalization. Now the Turing case was an interesting because you've got the same country, but there had been a reaction back the other way. But basically, during the interwar period, um, England had adopted extremely liberal laws uh, regarding uh, homosexuality. Right. But, um, in response to a kind of a, a, a sort of a nationwide sense of, of profound regret for what they had done uh, to this to this great man, I mean, the same thing happened in the ancient world after the death of Socrates and so on. So you know, I, this is why I, something tells me that this, this case is something of a watershed, um, and and yet that does not. Uh, take away the the terrible, terrible reality, you know, that I think we we have to face here. And this is a terrible consequence for one man, you know. And um, Whether he's the person who creates the precedent that loosens up society and makes them more rational, it still doesn't take away from the fact that this is a a tragedy, an absolute tragedy. You know what? You know what I had a dream about last night, Jeffrey? I had a dream that I was involved in a in a prison break with uh, uh, Ross Ulbricht that that we got a group of people together and we were on a ship. I don't know why we were on a ship, but somehow like he was being shipped to like this prison island, and so a group of us got together and we like broke him out. And I can tell you, I was so happy in that dream. I was I felt empowered, and I haven't felt empowered for the last few days. I have mm. felt defeated. 
I oh. felt crushed and powerless. But in that yeah. dream, I, I felt empowered. And I think what we need to do is just look at ways to get back our power, give power back to the people through, you know, technology, um, through just like believing that the people are inherently good, you know? So let's fight for what's good and let's just not lie down and take it. Right? And let's not let injustices stay. Let's not, I mean, there's 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 always hope and I, I'm going to look forward and uh, to seeing how it plays itself out to find and discover the, the most likely unexpected sources of hope and even growing out of this one case. Yeah. Um, Naomi, we are bumping yeah. up against the next show. Uh, mm -hmm. just in case people don't understand what's about to happen is that uh, Tatiana is actually interviewing um, Lynn Ulbricht. And I think we should all watch. Yeah, definitely. All right. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. And thanks, everyone, for coming okay. and joining in the conversation. This is you know, such an important issue. So see you all on the, on the next video. Goodbye, Naomi.